Light on Earth podcast with your host, Jake Weaver, engineered by Cedric Swan. Hey, everybody, we're back with another episode of Midnight on Earth. I'm your host, Jake Weaver, and as usual, say it every time, we're here to bring you more knowledge, more lights, more love. I'm super honored to have as our guest this week, I can't believe this is even happening, the one, the only No Simple Road podcast. We have Mel and Apple and Aaron here. This is incredible. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get to them. We're going to get to them in just a second. We're going to hold our horses. We're going to. Hold your horse. We're going to get to you. Hold. <laughs> gonna, Hold. But first, Whoa. I need you to do something for me. Follow me on Instagram at midnight underscore on underscore earth. That is the address. If you go there, follow me. Shows up in people's algorithms. What you're into, they're into those other people. And then they'll show me to them. Because of you. And I really appreciate that. Spotify, you can follow me there. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you go to get your podcast, click that button that connects us. Then you'll get those notifications when another episode drops. You'll know instantly. And then you'll get that, that knowledge, whatever these guests are trying to share. Of course, most importantly, tell a friend, tell a family member, go door to door, set up a stand by a supermarket tell people about midnight on earth if you know that they like these type of subjects these type of conversations you know it's up to you it's up to us to spread the word it's not about me it's never about me but it's about the guests and their information that they have they need to get it out there i need your help getting me out get it out there more i need your help to get it out there more midnight on earth.com all right, yeah. so now that that's out of the way, I got to do it every time. You know, we got to put it out there. And after I get like 3 million followers, no, 1 million, give me a million followers on Instagram, YouTube, and all the places, and then I'll stop stop asking. But maybe I won't. We'll see. Well, just follow Jake. We've been how following just, Jake for a while. Simple 10, Jake, Jake is fun to follow. So yeah, feel follow free. Him. We've followed him for a while. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read the bio. No Simple Road, the podcast. Here we go. No Simple Road is a podcast representing the truest manifestation of the heart and soul of the American psychedelic music community. Part of the Osiris Network, they have logged over 200 episodes. I haven't even hit 50 yet. That's why there's a reason they're on 48. They've logged over 200 episodes since their inception in 2017, featuring a wide array of guests, including musical luminaries and people in various roles within that community real people with real situations you can relate to filtering their perceptions through the american psychedelic experience and the american jam band music scene because we have so many international listeners you know they we're talking about something specific here and sitting digitally with you the audience creating an amazing intimate experience they're very much focused on building community mm sharing what they learn from each experience they have with the people that are listening and no simple road.com. And here's what they wrote about their podcast. I pulled this off the internet. This is them saying this. Now we are more than just a grateful dead podcast, more than a music and culture show, something other than a deadhead family of cosmic wanderers where real people living a life uncommon. It really has been a trip to see where this show has taken us and we're just getting started. We started a Grateful Dead podcast and soon it became about so much more than just the Grateful Dead. It turned into a show about the whole music scene, the community of freaks, hens, weirdos, misfits, dabblers, and wild cards that we are a part of and love so much. Wow, that was incredible. Guys, thank you so much for being here. All right, thanks for everything, yeah, Jake. Woo. Have a good night. Uh, that awesome. was it. You know, that's, all you, that's all you and needed to know. Six-minute podcasts, <laughs> it's the new thing. <laughs> Nobody has time for shows anymore. But actually, I have to tell people, because you're not visually seeing this, 
I'm very blessed and, and, and was very gracious of the No Simple Road crew to allow me to bring my portable equipment here to their studio. That's and record right. live from here. So I'm, I'm literally Welcome in, to our studio, Jake. In You're the in the headquarters. The headquarters Get it? Of, <laughs> of No Simple Road, this podcast. And we talk about mystical things on Midnight on Earth. We talk about spiritual things. And we have listeners from those sectors, the, the New Age sectors, the spiritual sectors, people that are looking for this type of information. And, <clears throat> and maybe they don't know about this wonderful scene that is going on in America with a certain type of music that attracts a certain type of people. And then they created a ritual around it. So, so here's in a very, very basic description, what, what kind of we're talking about when we talk about this psychedelic scene, this jam band scene here in America. So there is a band called the Grateful Dead. And incredible psychedelic band that came out of the 60s, which was the height of the psychedelic consciousness movement. And during that time, part of that experience was taking psychedelics and experience the sh experiencing the music in a ritualistic fashion. So you would take this drug that would open you up in a shamanic way. You'd be exposed to people that were feeling the same way. And collectively, you'd be watching these concerts that had shamanic music as kind of their undertone because the musicians themselves were also part of the culture experimenting with those same uh, psychedelics. Well, in time, that evolved into a bigger scene, which included other bands through the 70s, through the 80s, the 90s. It kept going, and it became a community within itself with different bands and different fans of bands, but underlying the entire experience is this collective ritual of people getting together at these concerts and not everybody takes psychedelics, but getting together at these concerts and taking these psychedelic substances in a way that's very ritualistic and then focusing, like I said, on the bands and this music that's guiding them in a shamanic way. And then they have these incredible experiences at these shows. So over time, this has kind of developed into a, a scene, a community, and just this other reality that you can step into if you wanted to. You know, you have to find it, but it's here. And this is what we're going to talk about today. I want to go back to something that you said, you know, the, the whole psychedelic experience of going to a show and the shamanic experience of it. On the surface, if you just look at the thing, like take the Grateful Dead, for instance, if you are a casual um, listener to the dead, you may not hear that. You may hear a country band. You may hear a, a jazz band. And um, I think part of the magic of the music and the scene is that on the surface, it is something completely different. And when you are... Um, when you take a psychedelic and go to a show, it's a completely different thing than you had thought. At least that was my experience with it. Like, it looked like something on the outside, and then when I got on the inside of it, it was something completely different than what I had imagined. Well, it seems that it's created for that dimension. So when you take these psychedelic drugs and you create this biochemical reaction, you actually step into this other dimension where there's different information, there's different energy, and you're able to process those things because you're, you're there. You, you've, you've got there because of the substance in that moment. And, and we, you know, we always talk about these things and it's not just the substance, but it is a quick catalyst to get you there in those moments. And uh, when you're there, you can see it from that perspective. And the musicians, they design it for that experience. They know that the majority of the crowd is taking psychedelics. Open those doors of perception. Yeah, <laughs> and they create these really long segues of music that can guide you and take you all these different places energetically. And it, uh, it's an amazing experience. And it, like Aaron was saying, on the surface, if you've never really sat down and, and gone through the ritual, you don't exactly know. You can kind of tell that something's going on just based on everybody's behavior. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but until you actually do it yourself, it's, it's hard to understand. I've done a lot of different psychedelic 
adventures in my life. And, and I would say the top two, it's, it's in the top two of the most profound and altering was my first Grateful Dead concert. I mean, it completely changed everything. And like I said, I had no idea. I thought the Grateful Dead was a country band. I, I had heard trucking and, you know, Casey Jones and, and that, and walking into that first show was so startling and beautiful and terrifying. And, um, it it was a experience that I haven't really found a match to in my life in 30 plus years of, of following the music. Yeah, and it did get added on to as the Grateful Dead, as we know, Jerry Garcia passed away in 1995. I mean, we're in 2021 and, you know, it's kept going. Other bands came into play. No one actually filled that void of the Grateful Dead in that way. But other bands took up the mantle and and each one kind of carried a certain torch and allowed the greater scene to continue. Yeah. Yeah, I I look at it like a tree, Um, and the the Grateful Dead are are the root system of that tree, and then you've got all these different branches, and I don't know, Apple and Mel can attest to this, I think that the the whole scene was kind of fizzling a little bit, Not it, it just wasn't as mainstream and popular as it is right now, and in 2015, the Grateful Dead had uh, their Fare Thee Well concert, it was called, it was... Um, I think it was two nights in Santa Clara and then three nights in Chicago. And it was their 50th anniversary. And all the surviving members got together with Trey Anastasio from Fish as the guitar player taking the place of Jerry Garcia. And uh, we were lucky enough to be at the Chicago shows. And it birthed an entire new wave of the scene happening. And a lot of new music started. Reignited it. You know, it was dormant for a while. I don't think it was gone because I think that the people that showed up for these concerts proved that it wasn't gone. Like, I don't think everybody dusted off their old hippie clothes from their closet. It was authentic. Being there seemed like it was maybe not going back in time, but like I said, reigniting something and and bringing all those people out from wherever they had been resting and having their little reprise. And that going to those shows in Chicago was my first experiences um, with the Grateful Dead. I think we'd seen a couple shows in Vegas. We'd been to Phil and Friends and like Chris Robinson brother. But I didn't didn't have any context for it because I joined the um, Grateful Dead uh, concerting and, you know, scene way way after in 1995 I was having my daughter I wasn't concerned with concerts but going to those shows in 2015 Mm -hmm. um, I started to understand like whoa this is not just like a band that plays good music that people are coming to see this is a re-emergence of something that once was that is so excited to get back to what they were doing that's what it was like for me from the outside because i know aaron and apple are a little bit older than i am and they had actually had experience seeing the real grateful dead before uh, jerry garcia passed away so this is um me 10 years later seeing it brand new minus jerry garcia and seeing 20 years 20 years look at that 20 years my math is (laughs) off but yeah it was um it was something to behold to everybody who maybe doesn't know anything about the Grateful Dead. Um, maybe you think you don't like it. I was on that train. Like, not that I didn't like it. It was just, you know, whatever. That's cool. That's fine. You know, a handful of songs that I can get down to. And it kind of a, goes back to what Jake was saying. Like, until you uh, indulge yourself into the psychedelic aspect, you don't have to. But when you do you come away with a knowing that you didn't have prior to taking that. And that that's it. Like, it's not like you don't get to have fun and dance and all that. If you, if you aren't um, partaking, it's just that you get a little bit of a different experience when you are on psychedelics and you can kind of understand 
the music and the dancing and the camaraderie in another way that you, you never could have experienced. I think everybody gets on the same frequency because they're also on psychedelics and you're all opened up. You know, that's part of the experience is having tens of thousands of people together feeling that same thing, that divine energy, however it shows up for people and and they're opened up and then you get in that group mind. I think that that's absolutely a huge experience into itself. It's very humbling. And then that's when you start to realize that there's so much more going on. Well, yeah, so much, you, so can, much you, know, you can get that feeling without taking psychedelics oh, yeah. or without, For or sure. if you've taken a, I've been to show street and you end up getting high from the club around you of the crowd. Cause that you're tuned into the, to the energy. Yeah, that frequency is so strong. You just automatically end up getting, you get a contact high. But I, I will say this though, um, prior to taking psychedelics, um, it's a lot harder for me to understand how to get to those types of mindset, mind frames, you know, um, when you've taken psychedelics and then maybe you choose not to go to a concert um, taking psychedelics, it's almost like you can remember how you felt and refeel these psychedelic Tune experiences. Back into yeah. that station. So it, like, yeah, yeah, so it's easy to kind of not be high and be around people that are maybe under the influence and feel like, whoa, you know. But prior to me ever having a psychedelic experience, I, I didn't know that and I never had gotten well, that. It, it, for me, like the like I was talking about my initial experience with it, I had taken a lot of LSD before I ever saw the Grateful Dead and had found that peculiar LSD space of telepathy and synchronicity and connection and thought that I was like the only one like I had you know because I had the only one that figured it yeah, out I had no <laughs> and, and like and the music was the special secret that I had and because it aided in the trip and going to my first show the reason i think part of the reason anyway that it was so profound and life altering is that i found out that i wasn't the only one that there was a whole community of people that shared these values experiences and perceptions and and, and there's I, nothing like looking at someone else's eyes and not having to say anything right and, and just the the underlying knowing of whether it's the jam, whether it's the uh, the feeling, whether it's the location, something coming alive and just smiling and looking at someone else's eyes that I mean, I've been to a lot of concerts prior to jam band concerts. And yeah, when a good song is coming on, it's fantastic. But there's not that knowing. Yeah, well, and also like it was also a lot of like for me second guessing the experience i i spent a lot of time in that space and then i would come down or come back and be like well maybe that didn't happen maybe that wasn't real maybe that's just me and then going to that first show and realizing that i'm in a room an entire coliseum filled with telepaths and that we're connected on the same frequency and that the band is transferring energy from another dimension into the room that we're in and we can affect change in the music in the moment that was really like it sounds so easy to say it right now but walking into that for the very first time was earth shattering you know what I'm saying? It's very much undercover in America. Like they don't publicize it. I think it's probably intentionally because they don't want people having exposure to these substances that may open them up a bit. But it seems like, uh, you know, there is strength in numbers. So it's hard not to see the publicity of the Grateful Dead when they have these huge concerts yeah. and even the newer version, the Dead and Company. Um, but it is still kind of this undercover thing where really – you have to seek it out or it has to like come to you in a way and you have to be open to it. <laughs> and it's always been set up because America doesn't really have like this shamanic aspect to our culture. Like we don't embrace uh, the mystical, those dimensions in a very mainstream way. Well, so it's, a, it's a colonial mindset. <clears throat> we have a colonial mindset in the West out here. It, and it's very, um, you know, anything indigenous is, is, played down or taken over and destroyed. Yeah, but we uh, subscribed uh, the shamanic kind of title or role to musicians. Right. It's, and then when you talk about ones that are working with psychedelics and, and understand that and incorporate that and actually design it for that, it becomes like 
the shamanic ritual in America, the in Western culture. It's like where it shows well, that up. Thi- that thing is not going to stay asleep. That earth energy, that other dimension is not going to stay dormant just because of a mindset of a society. Right. That thing is coming out and it's going to find a way. You know how they say Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Well, <laughs> that shit finds a way, man. Well, and, and in that shamanic community, there is music involved in that. Right, Even definitely. if you're in the jungle or you're in a desert or wherever you're at, if you're, you know, participating in these shamanic rituals, music is not left out. Dancing is not left out. No, it's interesting. So you're imbibing in whatever it is, whether it's a drink, whether it's a, a powder, a substance, whatever you're doing, and then you're getting chanted, you're saying prayers, you're sometimes talking in unison, like... This is our equivalent, a Western right. equivalent. That's the word to, I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, to what um, you know, these other indigenous cultures around the world um, have been doing. Yeah, it's been going. It's been going on since like cavemen when he discovered noises, started dancing, and you're ingesting things that Mother Nature has put there for you to use Absolutely. to expand your mind and stuff. I mean, well, then it also we talk about this, and and I should mention that the reason it's intentional, the reason that. Uh, the wonderful guests of No Simple Road are here on Midnight on Earth episode number 48. It's because I was very lucky to be a guest on their show way back in episode number 48. So I tried what? really hard. <laughs> Double 48. What does it mean, man? I, I tried really I hard to it. sync this up. I begged these guys to be on for this number. We said so, no for a long yeah, time. We, <laughs> we, we like begrudgingly agreed. <laughs> But, you know, we talk about this. So I've been on their show as a guest, and we've talked about this. Well, we're past. also friends. Of course, that as well. Yeah. There were, I mean, 10 out of 10 friends. But professionals were out in the world in our, in our roles as uh, speakers in, in this way as well. You know, we're on each other's platforms. Right. But uh, we talk about how this scene that we're talking about is, in a sense, a mystery school or where the current manifestation of a mystery school shows up in modern American culture you know, they have people out there now that are saying, oh, I have a mystery school. You know, you can sign up. I have a mystery school. You can sign up. And maybe No Simple Road has a mystery school. You can sign up. You can up. sign up. That, maybe there's some, some validity to those places. Maybe th- these people have created this true learning center where you, you can figure it out. But the ancient mystery schools were different. You know, they would vibe people out. They'd read your aura. They'd read your frequency. And then when you were at a certain level of development, they'd contact you. And if you were open to it, then they'd let you in and initiate you into all these different things. And so how it shows up as a mystery school in Western culture is that you go to these shows. That's exactly how it happened for me. Yeah. You go to these shows, you'd have these psychedelic experiences and you'd meet people and, and you'd have this feeling. And if you went after that feeling, then it's you're, like an initiation. Yeah. It's, it's your self own initiation. In, self initiation and you have to pursue mm-hmm. it. If you go after that feeling and you pursue it, then that's how you develop and your, and that's where the mystery school aspect comes into play. Self in the fact that whatever circumstances brought you there, you still have to come of yeah. your own accord and you have to make a choice to go after more yeah. information. Yeah. And, and to do something with the information that you receive there, because like Aaron, he didn't know what he was going to get there. And then now you have to, like pack it all in you don't know what you're gonna get so there is some kind of um i don't want to say work but something that you responsibility yeah you have to pursue it and and like jake said about the vetting (laughs) process people vibing you out that is exactly what happened to me i met some people in california i was living in vegas at the time i met some people in california that were deadheads i didn't know they were deadheads and we tripped together a few times. And after tripping together a few times, the one cat that was like, you know, the, <laughs> you got the do Aaron this. of the group, the air, yeah, <laughs> the conductor of the group. He was like, yo, man, you need to come to a Grateful Dead concert. And I was like, fuck them. I don't want to see trucking for 45 minutes or whatever. And he was like, I'm going to buy you a ticket and you're coming with us and, and we'll puddle you. And May I, was like, I say okay. this too um, about the um, Grateful Dead community and not just them, but just we're talking about that. Um, some of the most unselfish people that I have ever met because these people would spend their own money to buy a perfect stranger a ticket just so they can get the experience. Yep. And I have never in my entire life known any other group <laughs> in the world to have their fans be that excited about 
other people seeing the music, that they would willingly give up their own ticket, that yeah. there's people in, in the lots of other concerts putting up their finger to get, no, I've never seen that in my and, life. And they made it, part, the generosity, a part of the culture. Yes, they right? did. Which and, was really and, interesting. Which, Are you kind? That's a, that's a part of what we're talking about. Um, the shamanic ritual, the um, whatever it is, is like people, it's not, a personal thing like mine. I it's I own it. It's like we need everybody to see what's up. This is not just for me. This is like you need to know you need to go to your first show. You need to get in. Like I've never experienced that before. Yeah, and it's because of that specialness like that comes from touching that energy. Whatever that is, yeah. that mysterious energy, it's divine or whatever it is. Like when you interact with it, you you, you want other people to experience it. You know, you yeah. want people to, to, to have those same feelings and shout out from the rooftops. It's the bees knees, man. It is, <laughs> well, it does. Oh. It's, it is kind of, <laughs> it's one of those things like, you know, I want you to try these shoes out so bad. I'm going to buy you a pair of shoes. It's, it's this kind of marketing that you can't get from any other thing. <laughs> it's, it's grassroots at it's like most vital and real kind yeah. of thing. It's, it's making something it, so special to yourself that all you want to do is have other people experience that thing and feel it the way you felt it because it felt so amazing. And it can't be bought. Like, of course you can buy the ticket, but those, these feelings and the generosity and the camaraderie that can't be bought. Well, the thing is, and it really uh, dawned on me years ago is that what we did is we created a new paradigm, like a different mode of living. You're like your behavior, your normal is different within this other paradigm. So people that got really immersed in, Grateful Dead culture and jam band culture and concert culture and that whole world lived in a different mode of existence. When you go to these shows, there's a different set of rules. There's a different what's okay, what's not okay. It's more open. It's more loving. Like time is different. Like you can grab, like I couldn't really go to a public shopping mall and grab a random person and be like, what's up my friend? (laughs) (laughs) And and you like them all too. And then potentially like squeeze squeeze their nipples and be like, you little bitch. And then walk away. I'm going to get your butt. And then. Yeah, there is a lot that goes on. Wow, you guys made it weird really fucking fast. It's not weird. It's not weird in that culture. But if somebody grabbed, came up to you at a concert and these fun and like a cape, these fun psychedelic (laughs) concert was like, what's up? Like you accept that. I would end up having a well, best friend yeah at exactly that show. and that's something about the scene too the way we just went through right here it's that prankster aspect they yeah bring. there's such a sense of humor within the community too and camaraderie and fun from sharing just a simple smile to the glance of the well, eye to that not talking to communicate and they love having fun joking around making prank fucking with well yeah i mean like it did come from the original pranksters i mean yeah. you know episode seven ken babs we had the original the hippie on the show and you know the juxtaposition of that it's like their their influence of now to then it's like you can see how that influenced the culture oh to be wild to be free to play, play jokes on people be yeah. fun and loving like it also it, it too man there's an aspect of the community that I, it doesn't exist anywhere else that thing that you're talking about we're like hey bro you know yeah, that, yeah. it's just a, a given it's not even assumed it's just an informed part of the culture that like we're family do you know what I'm saying? Like right. when you walk up to somebody, you're not wondering if they feel like your brother. That's your brother. You're already connected. It's that's yeah. it. You already have the connection. Well, Mel said, it, Mel said like, like, like that with the fans and everything, the way it is, there's no other band to drive down the street. You see a steely on another car or something. You instantly know that's family. You don't see that with other bands. No. If you see I'm a lightning, like yeah. The dude with the Aussie sticker. Going, <laughs> hey, crazy train. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it, yeah. it's true. After going to concerts and seeing people with any type of um, grateful dead, lightning bolt, skull, anything, I feel like home. I feel like I'm like, oh yeah, they know what's up. So I'll easily talk to them instead of, you know, kind of let them pass ordinarily, you know? Yep. Yep. And, and getting back to the whole mystery school aspect of it, you know, part of the Grateful Dead culture back in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s was when an older head took a younger head under their wing, they would 
plays tapes for them and teach them the music and bring them to shows and teach them the rules of the road, so to speak. And I think that's something that is, um, I don't know, in my experience right now is a little bit missing. And I think that is part of the charm and mission of No Simple Road is to fill that spot. Well, I feel like we definitely take people under our wing to let them know that that family feeling that you may have felt at the Grateful Dead, it's it's digital now. It's alive it's, outside it's, of it's the show. Out, it's not just in our lot that we have to go to this specific show. If you tune in to No Simple Road, you are on the lot. You are the brother. <laughs> you are in the family. That's and, a great way to put it. Well, that's how I see it, truly. Like, yeah, for when, real. From, based on all of the listeners that um, have chosen to write in, based on like our five-star reviews, based on the people that have actually come to visit us from all over the country now um, to come on the porch and, and see what we're doing, they know and feel comfortable enough to ask us to come to our private home they feel comfortable enough to plan to meet us at different shows around the country. They feel comfortable enough to recommend it to their friends and their friends love it just as much as they do. And this is not like, uh, you know, uh, kudos to us. No, well, this it is, should be actually in this, a way because you guys is, have done great work. We have done great work, but this is a kudos to the spirit the of the energy yes. that is that Grateful Dead Maybe they, it's not exclusively theirs, but they definitely ushered it in. Well, and, and, right. and not for nothing, but I used to see these, like my first show was, uh, February 10th, 1989. And going to shows after that, I would see these older deadheads with long gray beards and long hair and that had been around. And I would think to myself, man, those guys, you know, they must know so much that those are like the elders of our community. And, um, at, at some point we became that and, Not me. and, <laughs> and I, I don't have a big gray beard, no, baby. no, you don't, <laughs> but you know, I, I, it would be a disservice to those people that took me under their wing back then to not fulfill that role in its totality. Now I feel like it's self perpetuating to be honest. Like it's like, if you're in the river, you get swept up. In the, well, in the, you in can, the current, you can, you can choose to get out of the fucking water. Yeah. Too. But at some point you can't, the river will take you. Yeah. And it, so I'm not talking about people that dip in their toes and I'm talking about people who want to find yeah, out no, what's I, going I on. In. Yeah. It Job does. In. It does have its own momentum. And your show, yes. like you said, is, is an interface point. It is the interface point for me when I think about this culture and, and what they're trying to bring to the table. I mean, this is, I call it the grateful dead of podcasts because like Mel was saying, it is that true true heart and soul of that scene like it is where you would go to get that information well, i just their love is is so important you know that i think at the at the base of all experience that i've ever had at a show if you like put that thing in a distiller the distillated part of it would be love that is the frequency and and mode that's connecting all of us in that psychedelic universe and it, it's m not only my job it's my fucking duty to spread that to every person that i can and if i have a digital platform i have to bring that thing because it it, it lives inside of me i don't have right. any choice well i remember early on in the show i would always say the only qualification for you to be part of the family is for you to feel like you're part of the family it's nothing on our part. Same as a deadhead. It's, that, it's not. Yeah, it's nothing yeah. that we're doing. Like, oh, they've accepted us. No, by just merely by listening to the show, if you feel connected and you feel like you belong, that's what it takes. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's the basis of going to a Grateful Dead show or a Fish show or all the other bands that are out right now that are doing that thing. That that's the that right there is the basis for being part of the community do you feel like you're part of the community did you have the experience and there you go and that's the basis of that kind of the be kind and mm -hmm. the open to everyone that's one thing that we carry on to the show for sure is it is treating everybody the same from yes, having awful. local bands just listeners on and as company and everything 
to, you know, to big time musicians and everything. Everybody is in this together and open. I like that, that you put that out there, Apple, because you're right. Like, it doesn't matter if we've had somebody that's on the show because they were listening to the show or if they're a big time musician. It's the same, same amount thing. of love. It's the same amount of attention. Yeah. The the questions are similar. Like, we try to get to know the family, not put them on a pedestal because of their... Um, Accomplishments. Accomplishments and it, talents. It, you know, one of the things that I've learned from, like, we've talked to some pretty heavy hitters. We've been really honored to talk to some big names in, yeah. in the jam band world. And uh, the thing that I've learned, at least early on, I was asking about the magic a lot. Asking questions about the, like, trying to look under the hood of the thing. And every single one of the musicians that we've talked to and ha and I've asked those questions to are very non-committal when it comes to those answers about those specific questions and, and a lot I, of and I don't think, think about it right, answers right and I think that is because of um, tr tr keeping the sacred nature of the thing sacred and we all know it's happening you know and trying to get under the hood of the thing sure you can do that personally and with your with your friends and family but in an interview that's on a platform that's going out to thousands and thousands of people may not be the best idea to put that out because you know maybe there's people that will misunderstand you know what and I'm there's saying? a lot of pressure too for musicians to have a mentality of knowing like do you know what you're responsible for? Yeah. No, I'm just fucking playing my part. <laughs> I'm playing the bass. Don't that is like a big part of it. killing it. And that's all there is to it. Like the minute you get your ego or your head wrapped up too much in it, you, the love is easily to kind of like not slip out, but it's, you just got to do what you do. <laughs> you just got to do what you do without fucking intellectualizing everything. Well, I should bring up, and I guess we didn't really touch on this. Is that a big part of the music that these musicians play is improvisational music yes. meaning they're making it up as, as they, they go based on yeah. chord structures or whatever they're feeling in the moment and, it, and it's a individual thing and also a collective thing so that aspect where they're just kind of like opening this channel to let inspiration in fusing with the people being on these substances and the the plasticity of that experience is part of the magic because people's energies uh coalesce into this Being kind of this unified woman. field and uh it, it, and we talk about it it opens portals so you know that's really and that's part that, of it that part openness of the experience. too that openness to the road the constant rotating cast of characters that you don't know what you're going to see they the artists don't know what's going to happen like at a festival right. you don't know who's going to end up on stage it's not uncommon for a four person band all of a sudden have 12 people up on stage with them jamming out everybody's songs and it's so organic. They don't even know where it's going to go. Yeah, And it's never it's the same constant creation. It's never the same show twice. We sh I should kind of clarify that yeah. because I, you mm -hmm. know, it's like I, we know all this stuff because I've been going it's to very shows. True. It's hard to like since remember the all the things that yeah. are unique about it when you're a part of it. Yeah. But okay. So every show is different. They have different set lists. And part of the ritual is that they play two sets so they'll have a first set that's kind of like a, you know, warm up or in some cases a first set of really strong music. And then they'll have a set break as part of the ritual where you'll, it's almost like the break at church where you meet people around you. It's and a time it's, to connect with yeah, the, time with to the connect people you've with, been celebrating. Yeah, with. the people. And they're also having the similar experience that you just had. And then they go into set two, which is usually as more people are deeper under the influence of these uh, oh. substances. And usually takes a, a deeper, more powerful turn. And then, of course, they close it off with the encore, which is kind of like lets you know. And, and my psychedelic experiences at these shows, that was always the, the rhythm was the always the goodbye. indicator was like, OK, oh, shit. Like that just all happened in about three minutes, that three hour concert. So that second set's over. I get one more song. And that's like your indicator. You got you got to come back to reality now. And yeah. and for everybody out there who's never been to a show, that one more song may be 15 or 20 minutes. Right. right. So they're doing, it's almost like three sets because yeah. to somebody who's gone to just a regular you, concert and doesn't really, you know, maybe they do an, a, a brief intermission. It goes on for about three hours and two and a half to three hours. Oh yeah. It's, on an, the show. it's an entire evening. And here's, here's another part of it that isn't widely known outside the community. 
when you go see, I don't know, insert pop culture musician here. When you go see them in Chicago, you're going to see the same list of songs in Chicago that you're going to see in Philly. That you're going yeah, because it's like a show. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, a rehearsed. When, when, yes. when yeah. you go see these concerts, the the song list for each show is completely different. And I'm just going to take the band Fish as an example. They don't plan what songs they're going to play before the show. So the lead guitarist for the band is Trey Anastasio. And he has a ritual that he does before the show. And he's talked about this publicly. He'll go into the restroom of whatever venue they're at and go into one of the stalls and close the door and sit down on the toilet. And he prays and he says, God, whatever is supposed to happen in this room tonight, let it happen. And he says, when he opens that door to the stall, he lets God go out before him. And when he walks onto the stage, and feels the energy that's in the room, that's when they pick the first song that's going to happen for that night. So it's it's a part of the ritual is the choice of songs for the night because those songs will fit what it, it, the magic, vibe of the room, the vibe and, of the yeah. room, and the story that's happening and playing out with each one of the people individually somehow. It that show that happens and that we call it a set list. For that night, the songs that were chosen somehow fit your experience for that evening perfectly. So not only is the set list improvisational, but each song in itself is improvisational. So you are getting, nobody knows what you're getting that night. Not even the band. They know they're going to play. You know, they're going to, you're going to hear them, but that's where it stops and starts. We step off the cliff together. Exactly. And going to a fish show is something that was a hugely transformational piece in my life because yes, I had been to a dead and company show prior to that, but fish is every like, it's kind of like meeting us, everybody different, right? You meet a certain person and they're very intellectual. And then you meet somebody who has very humorous and then you meet somebody who's very sexy. And then you meet somebody who is, you know, just silly. There's, each of these bands have their own kind of personality and fish mm-hmm. brings the fun. <laughs> I don't care pH. what's going on. <laughs> they can, they, they can, you know, do some little ballad kind of stuff and make you kind of slow down a little bit, but nevertheless, they're, I've never seen a band that was so dedicated to making people have fun in that improvisational world. And so that's what I wanted to throw out there because it's not the same thing that you're going to get. You go to see these other, um, you know, say like an Umphreys McGee or a Joe Russo's Almost Dead. Um, These are all bands that may or may not play similar music, but when you go there, you'll see the personality is completely different. Yeah, Yeah, they all have a different vibe, a different feeling. They're going to take you to a different place, which is part of the allure. This is why it's continued for so long since jerry garcia passed i mean it did come in waves prior you know after jerry passed in 95 and then as mel was talking about earlier in the show uh the fair the well concerts in 2015 i mean it kept going there were different iterations uh i can think of the other ones and then they became the dead but it was never yeah Yeah. i mean the dead was an interesting thing they had joan osborne in the band for a little while really i didn't know that (laughs) yeah i saw that red rocks 2003 warren haynes from government that was oh four yeah the warren days were oh four and uh you know it's it's uh it kept going it kept going for years there was a couple years where it seemed like it was really going to drop off but in 2008 specifically there was no one touring a bunch of bands had retired supposedly but it kept going because of the power of this experience, because of what people are experiencing. And they do bring other people because everyone intuitively wants to evolve. And part of my evolution is your evolution. So if we, in, in order for me to grow, you know, you need to grow somehow in, instinctively. I think that's part of the reason we bring our friends to these experiences and, and want to, you know, share and tell people about it is because of that collective evolution that happens. Well, yeah. let, let me, I want, I want to back up a second to it. This has to do with that to you know, just pose like a question here. Cause it seems to me growing up all the time, how we're talking about other music scenes and stuff to me, it never existed until we got into the grateful dead and the jam band world. Like most bands growing up, like iron maiden, all that 
<clears throat> to this day, like the pop, the really popular acts and everything, they do a world tour. Mm-hmm. It's announced a world tour. It's like the jam band community, Grateful Dead, consistently forever have just been touring the world. Yes. Not like a world tour. That's where like winter tour. There was no winter tour, spring tour, fall, summer it was year round. tour. <laughs> it was like the big tour for GNR or whoever yeah. it was. Guns N' Roses with, world tour and they played for three yeah, months and then that with, was it. With the improvisational jam band community, which now for many, many years has bled over into everything. That involves bluegrass, rock and roll, country, folk music, all of it has Jazz, come together yeah. and it's constantly out there. You don't have to wait for that one time out of the year that the band's no. at. There's constantly a scene in every town. Every town has a Grateful Dead tribute cover band. Every town has jam band. You know, it has become such a huge scene. Well, and part of what I love about it is it's not that commercial shit that's pushed on you and shit. It's organic. It's true. It's... But I guess that was the question. I mean, that that's to me never existed until we found out about Grateful Dead. It was well, like the was, world tour. What was of, really interesting is for people that have been a part of this community for a while, you might know this, is that after Jerry Garcia died and a lot of people that were on tour with the Grateful Dead, they, they say there was up to 30,000 people on tour with them, just following them around on every show Jesus. during their height and even into the 90s until Jerry passed. And a lot of those people went home to their communities. And, and all of a sudden, like, like, hippie fashion hippie culture became mainstream like mm-hmm. everybody started becoming like these hippies it was it was nationwide but it was squashed actually it was squashed by mainstream media like mtv wasn't it wasn't on mtv it wasn't on all of these places being promoted it was this underground thing because of the consciousness awareness that comes with that there was a tv show that MTV was going to do about jam bands and it was called Nomad and they did a pilot pseudo pilot episode. And in that episode was featuring a young Jake (laughs) Weaver and, but that episode never aired and that was, they squashed it because they didn't want this to come out. I thought that was so interesting that that happened in that time, but there was no, publicity it wasn't well, yeah, a rolling the stone it the, yeah, yeah record companies don't want a band that's giving their music away and letting people tape it and share it and everything hell no okay and now we're going to talk about one of the aspects of our scene and that is the <laughs> ritual aspect of how we feel like it opens these energetic portals because we talked about the improvisational music we talked about the psychedelics and how that all comes together but what we notice is in these situations is that as we have these experiences, it seems to be there this energetic exchange. This energy seems to be coming from somewhere and through the musicians. It's I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's channeling or what it is. Some of the musicians feel like it's channeling. They've expressed that. But like Aaron said earlier, sometimes they just like to just do it and not really kind of analyze it too much but there is some sort of channeling involved which is another kind of metaphysical aspect to this whole experience i i think um i remember it might have been ross james him saying that a great show is when your instrument is playing you you're not playing the instrument right and i think at least from personal experience and reading and taking plant medicines and other psychedelics there is a like you said earlier jake like a unified field of consciousness that's just next door to where we are in default reality and um you know like in the andes they call it pachamama it's the earth energy the the planet the vibratory field that we're all immersed in all the time whether we realize it or not and when our Uh, default faculties are kind of stripped back a little bit and we're doing any kind of ritual activity, be it ecstatic dance, um, playing music, yoga, yoga, any kind of pranayama, breathing, mantra, that all, any of that, which can all be translated to playing music. Then you're changing the frequency of your body and your mind and 
that I think is the thing that's coming through is channeling that earth energy, that loving m- feminine aspect of the planet coming through. One of the awesome things that I learned um, from being a yogi was our bodies are antennas and through the different postures that we um, put ourselves in, um, the different asanas, we are actually attuning that antenna to different frequencies. And then when you add the element of breath, now you are either increasing or slowing down this kind of consciousness um, that you feel or or keeping this periods for longer. Um, so when you are under the influence of something and you are dancing without abandon and you are not necessarily thinking of like your grocery list or you're cleaning your apartment or anything like that, it allows you to reach these different locations that you otherwise would not have reached and just pl- point and simple like you know on a daily day you, you wake up you brush your teeth you take a shower you Hopefully. get ready to go to work you whatever your <laughs> yeah whatever your morning <laughs> ritual is but you're not necessarily dipping your toe in and out of this um i don't even know what this to call this field. world the, 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 yeah this energetic field but if you take the time and sit there like aaron was saying and do some breath work turn on your favorite song and like just start dancing go to a concert all of a sudden you have reached other locations, whether they're mental, physical, emotional, that you normally otherwise wouldn't have been able to reach in a normal every day to day. Yeah. And you know, upon analyzation, like you go to these shows, I've been going to shows personally since 96 was my first show. I saw fish. I just missed actually seeing Jerry Garcia because I started going to shows in 96. So I saw like all the derivative bands and saw dozens of fish shows over the years and became a part of that culture. And, and as I started experimenting personally with psychedelics and, and really pushing the envelope with the experience, what I learned is that there were two aspects of this experience that really make it stand out even more than the mystery school aspect. And, uh, one of those things is that, and maybe it does play into the music school aspect a little bit, but one, one of those things is the recruitment aspect. There, there's this underlying kind of uh, situation of this like energetic recruitment. And then we'll talk about that in just a second. And then the other aspect is the fact that the ritual itself, the mechanics of it, how it's coming into this dimension is through the hands of divine beings. It's literally being organized energetically from outside, from these outer dimensions and coalescing and and forming into these events literally through, through the acts of God because, or whatever that is, that, that bigger thing because of the effects of these events on the people and how they go back into the world changed and also preaching a gospel <laughs> you could say of of understanding and enlightenment and bringing back to their community and there's nothing like that we talk about all the mechanics of the shows and the ritual and how it's set up and everything but there really is nothing like that and because of that there is like this this presence this kind of cosmic synchronicity and and guidance that that has been shaping the whole thing since the beginning just take the the cosmic aspect out for a second and let's talk about like the scientific side of it so everybody has seen the effect that sound frequencies have on sand you've turned on youtube and you can search it out you they have a metal plate that they place over a speaker and they'll pour some sand on the metal plate and uh, play certain frequencies through the speaker and the they'll start with a lower frequency and the sand organizes itself into a geometric shape and then they'll go up an entire step an entire octave and the higher they go the more 
complex the geometric shape becomes of the of the sand on the plate, right? And then we've all heard of I forget the guy's name, Japanese scientist that did studies with water. Oh, uh I keep wanting to say Miyazaki, but that's not right. <laughs> I know, but we love that guy's anime. It's uh <laughs> Oh man, it'll, it'll come back to me. I'm sorry. Well, it's it's, me right if now. you don't know what I'm talking about, they took water and they put it in two containers and one container they wrote hate on the water, on the glass, and the other container they wrote love and then they froze it and they took microscopic pictures of the ice particles in the glasses and the one that had hate written on it was all disorganized and bunched up and spiky and then the one that had love on it would look like beautiful... Um, geometric snowflake patterns and they did it with all kinds of stuff they did it with plants they anyway my point is if you just look at the physical aspect of the effect of frequency on matter and human beings are both water and we're silicon well you know carbon based and when you're inside of that field of frequency if you think about how those geometric shapes are organizing with those frequencies, you can extrapolate that down to the atoms, the molecules and the parts of your body. And you're being affected that way so that your body is frequentially, I don't even know if that's a word being tuned to those things and causing different mechanisms to happen within your brain because of the way that the, vibrations are affecting you you know you hear hippies always tell you it's a good vibe man well it's a frequency bath you're getting just yes. bathed in these right. frequencies and they're affecting you on a microcellular energetic level i mean they're organizing like you said those patterns those geometric patterns with those frequencies coming from these instruments beyond words i looked it up really quick it's masuro emoto emoto was the yeah. guy who did the uh water experiments he's got a book hidden messages in water definitely check that out but i mean i think the recruitment aspect too is that when you pursue the conscious aspects of what you're feeling when you pursue the community the love and how can i do better versus going into kind of materialism doing more drugs partying harder and and not really connecting in that way i'm not not to saying you can't maybe do a mix of both i'm not really sure but um as you develop as a human being and you, and you raise your frequency through the training that you get by going to these shows, then it's like you're part of this bigger field and the recruitment is internal uh, because, you know, we've talked about this on uh, no simple road in the past is that, you know, there's this concept in, in the reggae community. They talk about being a soldier of jaw army, you know, where you're just kind of like in resonance with God and you're just like, being a kind of like a servant, a soldier, just like embracing and representing the light, just like being that. And just kind of like, you know, being under the will of this like divinity says, so and they, they came up with this concept, the Rastafarians, you know, starting with Peter Tosh and his word sound power. And they came up with this concept of soldier of jaw army. And, uh, and that's kind of where you get to, it's like you come to this realization internally based on the experiences that you've had with the psychedelics, with the shows going through these portals and having these experiences. And then you decide, yes, I want to align with the light. Yes. I want to help earth get to this heaven on earth, new earth scenario. Yes. I want to help my fellow man. Yes. I want to exist in love. And then when you make that choice internally, that's when the recruitment happens. What, what do you think it is that is the catalyst that's causing that? Like, been to a lot of concerts in my life I, I remember i saw ted nugent i saw i saw kiss in the car <laughs> I, I didn't leave the nugent concert going you know i'm part of the unified field and <laughs> I, i'm a soldier in jaw army <clears throat> carry I, this on yeah i didn't leave ozzy or you know no but i did go to a, a revivalist show and that's kind of like what started aaron and i going back to concerts because i um, up until that point that wasn't co going to concerts was something that Aaron did when he was younger. And so it was a resurgence. And so it being a part of seeing that I was like, there's something going on. And it, this was not a, maybe it was a spiritual thing, but I didn't think it was at the time. It was like, 
holy cow, they're doing some really dope ass shit out there. And this is just one group that I never even heard of. Imagine. <laughs> Look at the name of the band. Yeah, uh, exactly. It so revived you. So shout out to David Shaw and the Revivalist because they're amazing. And they, as far as I know, they're not a Grateful Dead band. They were just killing it in Nashville, Tennessee on a weeknight and really revived something in me that I didn't know that I it that made you sleeping. feel something. It made it, you it feel, made something, feel something and that activated you because yes, that feeling was like this. And they were not spiritual at all in the sense like they weren't proselytizing. They were singing about, you know, breakups. And, well, that's you the know, power of music in yeah. general. And, and, you know, just to say, like, even if you've never been exposed to this music, it's not like you can only get there this way. It's yeah, just I wanted that. to throw that out there, too. That way, <laughs> you know, people out there that have had these incredible experiences, sans uh, psychedelics and stuff like that, like... You could, there's still a lot to be had when you're in. I mean, you could do it in country, like country, fine, oh whatever well, let's, bluegrass. Let's, let's, especially. Way back. let's go back to like, look at children. Like they always say, children or, or like like when you get to psychedelic level, sometimes that's reverting to that child brain. Right. Look at children, dude. Wiggles concert stuff like that. Oh dude, my god, that Hillary Duff freaking, concert. They well, like, well, and then then that gets a little get older. Fired up. Like like yeah. like you know <laughs> like like six years and under that enthusiasm and community that there isn't there in a room of children at a children's concert. Shit's through the fucking roof. The energy. And they're all connected and fucking that's infectious on the parents and everything. And it's like, but I wonder it exists in everything. There's so many ways to get to it and find it. I just wonder what the, what the thing is that's causing us. There's, there's a catalyst there. I feel like there's an imaginary button that it pushes in us. Well, I think it's like your role in previous lifetimes it's not just this lifetime it's like you've had all these different lifetimes where you've been presented with this choice of signing up with the light or going into hedonism materialism and just kind of this really base third dimensional existence and lifetime after lifetime we've all made the choice to do the right thing you know align with the light in our own way and so we get presented with these opportunities it's just our nature I think it's our nature as light beings. This is somewhere inside of us. Our truest nature is that love and that light. So when we're presented with that choice of activation, of going higher, you know, the catalyst moment, we make the choice. There, There's a show on Netflix right now. It's called Sweet Tooth. Have you heard of it? Uh, no, but I heard, I heard it's pretty sweet. Yeah. And it's all about that teeth. Wow. No. So the, oh, this show, sorry. <laughs> this show is about... Um, maybe a little bit in the future and, uh, maybe five years or so. And, uh, there's a virus that comes out and the virus is killing everybody. And as the virus starts taking over, anybody that has a kid has a hybrid kid. So the kids are coming out like half deer, half human, half what? pig, half That's human. True. Half oh, and this is a TV show? Yeah. Interesting. interesting. I don't watch television. That's interesting. So check this out. And so the people that are still around that haven't gotten, they call it the sick, that haven't gotten the virus <laughs> are like uh-huh. gunning for the hybrids. Oh my God. They, because they think that they're the cure for the disease, right? So anyway point is what what i see happening right now at least from my perception from my little corner of the universe it really looks and feels like humanity is splitting as far as consciousness is concerned that there's a divide going on and not i'm not saying like right and wrong or light and dark i'm not talking about any of that i'm just talking about like a bifurcation two different paths are happening and there are some that are connecting back to the unified field, the collective consciousness, the energy, the planet, God, whatever you want to call it. And then there's those that aren't. And, and that's a thing that's going on. And, and the, the, the reason I brought up Sweet Tooth is it was a really um, creative illustration of what I been thinking of for a while and then i saw this thing i was like holy shit that's exactly what i've been picturing in my head like we are kind of becoming this hybrid generation of like a friend of mine i was reading his bio his name is jeff firewalker schmidt and it's a part of the thing says he's a walker between worlds and um 
I never thought about myself or our community as that, but we definitely are. And I think humanity itself is going through an evolutionary shift right now as far as consciousness is concerned. And that's why we're seeing all the things that we're seeing in the world is a outward representation and a manifestation of that thing happening. And um, we're being, there's more being asked of us now as far as being members of Ja Army than there was before. Well, you definitely have to step into a leadership role at this point. If you're resonating with this and you feel this, you know, maybe you're a No Simple Road fan and you're checking this out, or maybe, you know, you're part of this community or just know of it, like me, or just understand these concepts and you feel the same way. It is time to step into a leadership role because that's what we need. We need people out there guiding the world that we want into happening. Like if we want the world to be this amazing place where everyone's united and we have the technology and the spirituality and everybody has what they need. And we're just this wonderful coexisting uh, species. Then we have to do the work. You know, there has to be some sort of action taking place. You know, and that's we were, where you step into that role. We were talking uh, to a, a guest um, on an unreleased episode so far. And Apple actually was talking about this in, in the, um, reference to the leadership um, he was talking about this gentleman is not just a leader but he's a teacher and that is a huge um, thing that doesn't get talked about is like sometimes just by your sheer age like years on earth you are older you have seen more it doesn't make you more important or more valuable what it does make you is you have a little bit more um things that you have seen and experienced under your belt. So one way to lead is to teach. It doesn't always mean to take on a role where you're telling people what to do. A lot of times people get turned off by that. Nobody wants to be talked at or talked to or, or, you know, made to do something that, you know, is for the greater good, but they don't really believe in it. You can teach people how to use their best um, judgment, how to use their talents for, their life around them for the people that they influence and for the people that um, come across their path because leaders don't always have to be the one in the front of the line. They can be the one in the back of the line, making sure nobody gets left behind. Mm. And also you are just being, yeah. And also I think the most powerful teaching tool that we have as elders in the community is leading by example and then using words when necessary. That's what that's what I'm 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 getting yeah. at is like you can teach just by being. Yeah. Lead by know? example and then use words if necessary. That's that's definitely from you have to say where that's from cuz Christafari. Pre- Christafari, it's a Christian the, a Christian reggae, reggae band. band that I I still love to this day. Preach the gospel. But that's use what they would, that was one of their songs and it was one of their um choruses. And it was preach the gospel, use words when necessary. And I always love that about them because they were on time with their lyrics. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and that's part of the whole thing. It's like being more, but then also not letting your ego get attached. You're just trying to just take what you've learned in your experiences, in your life, and just like share, share, and also just be that thing. You're radiating that. It's like a, like, like an antenna or some sort of radio. You're just broadcasting that frequency. So that's a, just being is also being a leader, but just it, it's internal. So you have to develop yourself. You, we just, we all just have to do better because of what's coming. Like, mm. and what's coming is our input into what this new world's going to be like we're going to have some serious input we're going to be designing it well it also man i think one of the tricks of the matrix that we live in is to make us think that the only way to affect change in reality is to either be part uh, is to be part of the system that you're wanting to change so we've got to get on the inside and, and vote our way out or um, go protest. And, and I'm not saying that those things are bad. Those are tools, right? A hammer is not a bad thing, but you can sure bash somebody's head in with it or you can use it to build a house. It's how the tool is used. So my point is <laughs> a misconception that at least that I see is that we can't affect change unless we're doing those things. And in my life and from what I've seen through 
living on the planet for almost 50 years is that the most effective way to affect change is to resonate with that field that you're talking about. The way to affect change is to change yourself because you are the one that's creating reality at the, at the base level. This is your movie. This is your experience. So if your inside, if your inner mind has changed, I'm not talking about your ego and the thing that's driving, you know, your daily day to day. I'm talking about what's behind that. If your consciousness is shifting and raising and growing and connecting more to the source of all everything, then everything outside of you by extension has to change too. And the more of us that sync up into that thing, that force, that love force is unstoppable out there. They can, whoever can be in power, doesn't matter. It, it's through the energy of the planet that that's what's first. That's, that's what's holding all of this together. All the other stuff on the inside of it, the games, the politics, the, the virus, the, this, the, that, the other thing, that's all secondary pieces of a a weird game that's going on inside of this matrix that we live in. I'm talking about outside that, the shell, that thing, when we connect to that, that changes the inside. And that's getting back to why we have these rituals and why we go to these shows, because it gives us the ability to connect with that outer thing, that inner most truest uh, representation of the source, whatever that is, that's our soul, our spirit that, that connects us to the, to the creator. That's how we can get there with these rituals, with these experiences. This is, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're celebrating. You know, we're celebrating. This has been a big part of my life. I don't really talk about it very much on the show, or at least I haven't so far. I talked about it a little bit, but this has been a big part of my development personally as a human being. Is going. Not mine as well. I know that for a long time, uh, the, the circles that I ran around with um, that were not part of this scene that we're specifically talking about, like the music scene, the concert scene, Grateful Dead, um, like my career or my family or my personal friends outside of that scene, there is um, something that I don't have to say that people just understand. And like we were talking about earlier, the the knowing, the smile, the nod in in that music and and grateful dead scene that when i'm with my friends that i may not offer certain information about myself because it's it's like telling a story from the very very beginning that you kind of have to know about the terrain you have to know about the characters in order to really get it but if you it's context know, yeah the context is really important and so um you know speaking to my beautiful spa friends uh, you know about a treatment that we perform they have the context but speaking to with that same group of friends about these concerts that are ch- totally changing my awareness it's it's almost impossible for them to get well, and understand. And the public perception of that thing has been well, yeah, you're druggy been altered or something. And, and vilified by mainstream. Yeah. Just, oh yeah, you're just under the influence, so yeah. that's why the was, dirty hippie, the druggy, the, the sure. whatever. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of context, I mean, when I had these experiences, and when other people have had these psychedelic experiences these, at these shows, which it kind of at the very barest minimum you could say that these concerts create a safe space Mm -hmm. for people Mm -hmm. to have a psychedelic experience they know that they're going to be there for a certain amount of time there's restrooms and security and And people family to watch and family to watch over it's like you're, you're okay so you know at the very barest minimums you can say it's that but when you have these downloads these psychedelic experiences and you tap into the spirit that's where you step it further and You go into the metaphysical, spiritual authors, you know, these books, you start stepping out, you think about be here now. He's Ram Dass, of course, is a big hippie, but at the end of the day, you know, there's so many different pathways you can take. And that's part of the midnight on earth experience is having space for these different people that have this knowledge that when you have these experiences, when you grow as a human being, whether it's through psychedelics or however you learn and grow and get to that place, There's knowledge for you from all these individual people that specialize in some certain aspects. 
of understanding. It's a good way to put it, Jake, because it's true. We all do have, you know, like the different paths, right? There's like the path of service and then there's the path of intellect and then there's the path of uh, pleasure and then there's the path of, you know, where at whatever your path is, but there's always going to be people that are on that path along with you to help guide or even just give you that nod like, yeah, we're doing it together. Yeah, you're on the right path. But it again, it's multiple paths. It's not one. It's many. Right. And I can't wait. I think about this constantly after this COVID scenario is over, after we're back to living into the pre-programmed matrix that works in that way without COVID and we're all out free again, I'm going to be out there interacting with these spiritual metaphysical people at these you know, expos at these conferences and things like that. And I'm <laughs> telling them about this experience, this mystery school that they have no idea about. That's something I definitely notice is that there isn't a significant amount of crossover Mm-mm. with the metaphysical new age spiritual community and the grateful dead psychedelic spiritual community. The psychedelic aspect is kind of where their meeting point is but outside of that there there isn't really a lot of crossover so it's uh, it's really going to be interesting for me as things reopen back up and i'm out there publicly to interact with these people and bring them to this ritualistic mystery school experience they're going to love it I, I can't wait you know i think one of the things that we we need to say too is that like when i i talk about psychedelic psychedelic the word means mind manifesting psycho and then delic and it doesn't necessarily mean you've taken a substance you can have a psychedelic experience through breathing you can have a psychedelic experience through running on a fucking treadmill i have it all the time and i think that's part of the the stigma thing that I was talking about earlier. Some people hear psychedelic and they're like, oh, no, it's scary. It's, you know, I'm going to think I can fly and want to jump out a window or whatever. But going to a show sober and having a transcendental experience is psychedelic at its core. That's what that means. Definitely. And so also in my youth, like I was very like, zealous about turning people onto the dead. I wanted everybody to have the kind of experience that I had. And, um, I realize now, like it is also not for everybody. This thing is another path. Isn't for everyone. <laughs> well, yeah, well that's where bands like tool come into play. And that's something I oh, talk yeah. about considerably with people is because there's plenty of people that do the same thing. They, they take, they take <laughs> psychedelics yeah, ritualistically there it is. and focus their psychic energy on this band, this metal, progressive metal band. Really, they're known as a metal band tool. They're known worldwide as a dark metal band. But these people do the same thing. They take psychedelics. They go to the show. They connect with other tool fans. And I've had plenty of tool fans tell me, Dude, I'm not into jam bands. I don't like jam bands. There's nothing. Tool there, is a jam band. Right, it, sure, in their own way, but there's never, they're never going to ever go to a jam band show. But right. they go to Tool and they take psychedelics and they have the same experience. There's definitely other well, ways I to mean, get there. We've been to radio or into head. nature and or, or yeah. the electronic scene. You think yep. of EDM. Yes, oh, yeah. Radiohead as Tipper. well. Yeah, Tipper, like, you know, th there's people that go out and they have these huge raves in force and they have that experience. Well, you know? I think going back to No Simple Road, um, we started out as a Grateful Dead band because that's band. a band. <laughs> Kind of, we did. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> You're the singer. <laughs> yeah, true. We, we started out as a Grateful Dead podcast based on um, telling the story about those turn on moments. And then we quickly realized that going to other concerts, we were being offered the same type of turn on. And so being able to um, show not just the Grateful Dead fans out there, but fans of any other music that you may find on the podcast the same thing is going on. Yeah. There's people that want to become bigger. There's people that want to shine their light. There's people who want to heal themselves. There's people that want to be of service. There's people that want to have fun. And all of that can happen not just at a Grateful and Dead that, concert. That Grateful Dead, I'm doing air quotes with my fingers, that Grateful Dead experience is happening 
all over the place with multiple bands in different genres now. The, I've I said this on our show a bunch of times, like the cat's out of the bag. Word is on the street. That thing has left the Grateful Dead lot and found its way to multiple genres of music and bands now that encompass the wider jam band. I yeah, they're, I, they're I using question. different types of music. Go ahead. I want to ask a question to everybody except for Aaron because we already know his answer. But Four. where was your first really turn on moment that from at a concert that you oh, really wow. recall? Dude, epic. Good question. Mel. No, holy cow. Well, let's, let's splice that into it. Let's add to that question. Um, the first turn on moment. Also, when was the first time you remember the Grateful Dead in that world entering your consciousness at all? Like as a child or, or, and or the first time you ever Got saw exposed it, to it or just something. like it entered okay. your consciousness. Because for me, cause I remember that that's why I bring that up for me. Uh, my dad was working, uh, helping at a video store in the eighties and, uh, the grateful dead movie had come out on VHS at that time. And it was in the music section. I looked over and I saw the, the skeleton, the U S blues, uh, skeleton, you know, cover of the, VHS tape and I was like what is this I remember like holding the tape going oh my god like what is this and there's this dude you know with the glasses the skeleton like holy shit you know as a little kid I was probably like five or six or something and uh and he's like oh those guys are terrible put that down and I was like okay dad those guys are terrible you know just like you're a kid putting it down Mm. like you're you're like a kid you, you you don't remember you know like it doesn't like you just go okay dad whatever you say like uh, but I just remember that was the first time it entered my consciousness. But really, it was, uh, man. Oh, man. You don't know your first show, Jake? Well, no, not I'm your, thinking. It's not necessarily correlated to your first, first show. show. Your it's first not, turn on moment. Yeah, one, you know, my first turn on moment was definitely not in my first show. But mm. um, I guess it was when Fish played at the Gorge in 97, which was also the very first time they ever played there. Um it was their very first show, very first time they played there. And it was the carryover. There was a little bit of carryover because Jerry had died and there was some carryover from some of the Grateful Dead lot people that were trying out the fish scene. And it, it didn't really match up. There was, there was It was a different energy. The Grateful Dead scene was way more wild and, and over the top. And, and this was more like structured and less, less wild. And uh, so there wasn't like a you know, they didn't feel fully at home. However, they were still selling uh, LSD that was from the Grateful Dead lot and that whole world. We call and, it family acid. Yeah, it was. And so I had some of that and I also took a half an eighth of mushrooms. I took like two hits of acid and a half an eighth of mushrooms and had this incredible experience at the Gorge, you know, with 30,000 people and, and fish his first time there and you know, as a teenager, I was a teenager and, and I just remember the lights, like, you know, like Chris Corota was doing the lights and, and I was just thinking like, Oh my God, they must know we're, we're high. How, why are the lights like doing that? Cause they do the, the lights would do these waves, like a wave of light and everybody would go, Whoa, like, you know, cause it would just like shock all these tripping hippies. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, they must know, they must know we're no. high. Like, <laughs> they do but that was my big turn on of the deeper spiritual stuff definitely happened later but that was yeah. my first like yeah. community like this is the ritual like vibe what yeah. was yours mel um well in with jake what jake asked what was my first like kind of like um just figuring out and knowing about the grateful dead and just yeah. the, enter, entering it into my consciousness i think was in 1995 when he died um it's not that I didn't know about them before. I just, I, I, they were nothing to me. They were like, just kind of like a white piece of paper. You know, I didn't know about them. I didn't anything of them. But on MTV, I remember them talking about Jerry Garcia dying and the fashion and the people. And I I kind of didn't understand it because I'm originally from the Bronx, New York and single mom and concerts were not a thing that we did. And hippie was not, it, it just wasn't in my my radar it wasn't in my vernacular it wasn't in my radar it, it just wasn't so I remember a sadness um across the music community 
from hearing about Jerry Garcia and the, and his picture, just his picture always being up, you know? So that was my first like, kind of like imprint of the Grateful Dead in my mind. But I, I don't I don't know if this is my first turn on moment, but this is definitely my most memorable was we were at the Palms and we had rented a suite at the Palms and um, it was around, it was in the summer. It had to have been in the summer and it was one of the first times that our daughter had come with us to a show. I think it was the first time. And I just remember being under the influence and walking through that place like I fucking own the joint because there was some kind of psychic and telepathic communication that I'm able to have with not just the other psychonauts, but with the plain everyday person and being able to do like the Yoda, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> over like nothing to see here, you know, um, that's Obi-Wan, but. Obi-Wan yoga, whatever, whoever it was, <laughs> but you guys know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but no, just being able to communicate in a certain way. And then with the music and then seeing my daughter dancing and yeah. our nephew was there at the same time. And we were up in these box seats and, you know, security is not usually very friendly in Las Vegas. You know, they're, oh. they're there to do a job. They're there to keep things in order. But I was able to have such an effect on the security guard. It, it was like we were BFFs. And she let me go down to the floor, which I did not have tickets for. And she was the on, not the only security guard I encountered by going down to the floor. <laughs> I encountered several. So I remember that. So Mel looked her way to the floor. I worked my way to the floor, and even still, when I got to the floor, there was another security guard that I had to convince. And I'll never forget it. I was like, hey, my daughter's right over there. We're up in the box, and then Aaron kind of like waves. And I'm like, I'm just trying to get her to come back up there. I won't be long. I promise. I'm not trying to come down here. We've got great seats up there. And mind you, I am really, really spun she's chewing her face off and at this, point. this guy was like yeah of course no problem go for it I, I see her right there yeah no problem so i dance my way in touching no one i'm like dancing like in a stealth manner where i'm just weaving in and out of everybody i get down there cut a rug with my daughter bring her back up and i just cannot tell you that the effect that that the power that I had that day, I'll never forget it in my entire life. And as we were going back up, all the security guards that were either high-fiving me or like giving me the nod. And my daughter was like in shock. She's like, how the <laughs> fuck do you know everybody? <laughs> you know? And, and it wasn't just one security card. It, it was, was like on them. each level. There's a the next one. They're like, oh yeah, okay, you're good. Okay, you're cool. Come on, come on. And here I've got like three or four people. It was her, her boyfriend, my nephew. I'm ushering people up and it was like, okay, this is a different game we're playing. This is a completely different field that we're in and you can still communicate. And so that, like I said, it wasn't my first experience, but it definitely turned me on to Wow. To I, remember we're leave, yeah. I remember leaving that show now too when you were saying that you were like, you were, you were like, hold on. You had to go say goodbye. I remember her going and talking to all the security guards. You remember that? Yeah. We we're like trying to, we we're like, well, we're going back to the room. She's like, well, I got to go talk to Bob and I got to say goodbye to her. Like all the security guards are like, Right on, Mel. You even exchanged information. Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. Guards. I sure did. Yeah, that was what a hell of a show. What about you? Uh, what about me? Yeah. Uh, what was the well, first time you'd seen the dead, like, in your Well, let me get to that second, because the first time, as far as a turn-on moment, and that happened to all of us at one point, was, like, I always go back to going and seeing Little River Band open for Fleetwood Mac with my dad when I was seven years old was the first time. That woke me to music. Wow. Like going to a concert, seeing my dad happy, seeing people drink. I, I don't remember, but I'm sure there was weed, everything going on. And just that was the first time I ever felt the comfort of music at like seven years old. And from that point on to this day, it's been a pursuit or not a pursuit. It's been in bathing Entrenched. in that happiness and everything like that. But fast forward from 76 all the way up to like, like aha, aha moment, finding where like we belong to what we're talking about was Aaron already talked about his first show, 89. We were both, he was like more into punk. I was into metal, but we both liked punk and metal. And that was like our scene, that more aggressive, you know, we're in our teens, getting out of high school, this and that. And then Aaron goes to season 89. 
come comes back like bro and i had deaf ears at that point i'm like whatever you fucking crazy hippie I'm like, oh my god <laughs> what the hell happened to him he fucking smells like patchouli now and lived fucking has a bus and oh i lost <laughs> my friend you know not lost my friend but oh okay he's he's out there i'll see him when i thought the same thing too like oh yeah dude of course he had an experience he took a whole puddle of acid and kind of that whole thing too and then 91 at sam boyd silver bowl i went to three three day run and the first day walking in like mr metallica ozzy that was like my shit then you know walking in like oh my god all these all these hippies and oh my god girls with hairy armpits everything smells like patchouli and i like just didn't understand it was like uh Okay, this is cool. I, you know, I loved Woodstock and Jim Morrison, The Doors, all that up to that. But this was like, this is dirty. This is dirty and weird. Something, but something about it was like, I don't know, kind of like a weird gumbo or something. Like, kind of stinks, but I don't know. It looks kind of interesting. But I still <laughs> want to taste same it. Same <laughs> thing. Go into the show. I'm walking in the show and I'm eating some mushrooms. Like, okay, you guys say, you know, I need to get a high. Same thing like Aaron, me and Aaron grew up doing a lot of uh psychedelics and stuff together over the years and but that walking in got in there and then took some acid too so i was rather elevated and then i just remember it was it was about it was about halfway through the show no we're not even halfway it was in the second Wait, set was it in okay. space yeah i guess i'd been fighting it like the first set like we we're talking about there's two sets and all this stuff the first set and just kind of get more comfortable with my son then all of a sudden fire on the mountain it was scarlet fire fire scarlet begonias into fire on the mountain and that just fucking hit something and next thing i know i'm dancing sweating i got spinners around me people handed me what all of a sudden i went like like that uncomfortable like Oh, chi kind of yeah oh, oh i just bumped oh sorry bumped Butt into someone like steel, clinch. yeah you're kind of bouncing around in that you're not in the groove and then next all of a sudden it's just like boom oh i can dance through the entire floor i can dance up to the front i can do this and just it, that same thing changed my world and that was that moment the first show and forever but, from uh, on then you were there yeah, what about you yeah. Aaron? what when was your first aha moment at that in 89 that when was, when was your first, first experience I, of the, you know, dead, like, yeah, when did you ass. first hear the, the, the sixth grade? I, there was a magazine or something that w I remember the term acid rock and it was like deep purple and Jimi Hendrix and it had the steal your face and it was so fucking interesting to me as a sixth grader, however old that is, I think it's 12 or something. It was like the most mysterious, coolest thing. And as I started getting into music, I loved the Grateful Dead art, but the music sucked. <laughs> I just was like, why do they have this art? And then their music sounds like shit. I don't get it. Skeletons don't go with country. Skeletons to me and you went with like Slayer. Yeah, yeah like um, heavy, metal like, and rah. punk rock and and. That first show, man, it, you know, it, the same thing I did to Apple basically was done to me. The guy that took me gave me a puddle in the lot of really good family acid. And uh, we walked around, we call it shakedown on the outside of the concert in the parking lot. There's like a flea market of everybody that was on tour selling all their stuff like t-shirts and jewelry and sandwiches and food and tapestries and all kinds of stuff so we walked around the shakedown for a while and the acid started to come on and i was felt like i was transported into onto another planet like tatooine or something like i don't know and then the the sea of people started being sucked into the la forum like a vacuum cleaner and I was just like caught in this wave of humans being dragged into this place. Mind you, I have a Misfits t-shirt on and a mohawk and uh, all these deadheads. And 
I lost my friends. I found out later that they split. They ditched me on purpose so that I would have the experience that I had. But I lost them. So I was just like following people I didn't know into the show, not knowing what was going on. And I walked in and there was all these girls with dreadlocks and long dresses spinning in the hallways of the of the Coliseum. They're, they're called spinners. It was like a family of deadheads. And the music had already started and they were playing a song, Feel Like a Stranger. And I felt so out of place and so lost and so scared and so high. Like I, I was on another planet and I could hear the music and the lyrics. And he said, inside you're burning. I can see clear through your eyes. Tell more than you mean them to. And I was just like, what the fuck is happening? How do they know? <laughs> right. How do they fucking it became know? a personal experience? Yeah. For it. Lit up and flashing like the reds and blues out there on the neon Avenue. And I was just done. I feel like a stranger. And he, and he goes on to say, it's going to be a long, long, crazy, crazy night. And I was like, oh shit, what did I get myself into? And by the end of the show, I was dancing in the hallways with those spinners. And I, damn, choked up. You're back. Yeah. I You're was back. I was you were home. home. You were home. home. You were back with and, your people. And Jerry was singing, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. Well. So were you Baby Blue? Totally. 100%. Well, I hate to say so it, but heavy. we could talk for hours and hours and hours, but it's all over now, Baby, Baby Blue. Blue. Cool. Well, here's the thing. Well, we'll talk. Well, thank, we'll talk. I want we to say thank, to I want to say thank you, Jake, to, for having us on the show, because that was really a beautiful, um, it's great to have this what you're we we're talking about on your podcast because yeah. of the crossover yep. yeah i want to have a place for people to come and get this information worldwide and even the information about what's going on with this scene this american jam band scene that's past the grateful dead it's clearly past the grateful dead even though it still includes some of the surviving members there's so much more it's a community of psychedelic spiritual people creating these rituals together and it's here and it's it's part of the metaphysical spiritual community it's one aspect of it that maybe you didn't know about and this is something that the no simple road podcast represents like they're representing this you want to learn more about this you want to check it out you go to their website it's no simple road.com no simple road at no simple road on instagram too and they have an incredible run of podcasts i highly recommend checking out episode 48 absolutely <laughs> <laughs> no, starting from there yeah. that was where the first <laughs> midnight on earth well, it started yeah. it was an incredible episode what midnight on, on earth is is a manifestation of the workshops that i was talking about in that episode if you listen to that episode you'll hear me talk about workshops and various things that all got sidelined as they were developing because of this COVID scenario. So now the podcast is a representation of that, but yeah, there's so much going on in the no simple road podcast world. You have to check it out. I, I want to say one more thing before we go. Oh, definitely. The, the, so the connection that we have with Jake, um, is we're family now. And that happened because of this community. Jake and I didn't know each other. We were at an Umphreys McGee concert here in Portland. We were through that portal and beyond that night. I And I glanced over and looked at Jake and said something to him. And we became we just started talking from that moment. And that is a direct physical representation of the love and connection and community that happens all throughout this jam band community and wider improvisational music community is that your family is there waiting for you. Your best friends are made during those moments in those shows. And the only requirement for being part of it is love. Yes, exactly. And just being yourself, just come with an open mind, come to these shows, you know, Google jam band, you know, go on a search engine, look what jam band is, check out this music. There's international shows. There's shows all over the country. You're a spiritual person. You're into these type of communities. Check we encourage it out. you to come, you know, we have a calendar of events on nosimpleroad.com. 
check us out. We're going to be going to all kinds of shows. If you yeah, are in the Portland area, or even if you're not, take a look at what we're going to go to, what concerts we're going to, and come come hit us up. Yeah, it, all you have to Write do to is us. take a look at that calendar of events and then shoot me an email at info at nosimpleroad.com and say, hey, I'm going to be at this show too, and we'll exchange information. You come with us, and we'll have a good time. Yeah, and, you know, we'll... Be out there. You'll see me out there. I go to these shows. You know, you'll see me out there. Come say hi. You know, just this is the community that we're building. You know, it's a worldwide community. All these communities are coalescing into this bigger community. And I just want to say that in this community, the Merry Pranksters, Ken Kesey, I mean, they started this whole thing. I'm probably one of the few people that actually got to take psychedelics with Ken Kesey and all the Merry Pranksters in an acid test scenario. So I'd like to th- throw that out there, you know, for people <laughs> to yeah, really, right very on. few people get to see that. <laughs> but uh, all right, people, I really appreciate you listening. No Simple Road. It's been an incredible episode. Oh, stay here. We're going to talk more through the outro music. People, we'll see you next week. Love you guys. Midnight on Earth. Whoa. Time's relative.